Chronic diseases such as autoimmune encephalitis can affect health-related quality of life of not only for the patients, but also of their families and caregivers. I am Susan Foley, co-founder and executive director of HESA, a nonprofit that was formed to support research and bring awareness of the disease called Hashimoto's encephalopathy, a form of AE. We are talking today to Stephen Nelson, whose wife also was diagnosed with Hashimoto's encephalopathy. Steve is a former board member of HESA. He is going to give us a glimpse of the journey he has been on with his wife. Good afternoon, Steve. I want to say first off that I am so appreciative that you are willing to talk to us today, as it is so important that people understand how a chronic rare disease affects the family. Well, I'm glad to uh, I'm glad <laughs> to step in and uh, and and you know give some feedback. I know I got some initially, and it's helpful to hear from people who have kind of are a step or five down the road and sort of see what's coming. So that, that I, I'm willing to to th this is good. Good. I'm so glad you feel that way. I know, Steve, that, you know, being a husband and a caregiver, that has to be hard sometimes. You have a dual role that you're um, working on here. How, how, does, how do you handle that? Well, that has changed a lot over time. So initially, um, the requirements of being caregiver were so overwhelming, along with the not knowing at all where you're going. So you've had all these bad things are going around. You're just trying to deal with all the disruptions and sort of the husband wife thing goes way to the side. So you're overwhelmed and um, you're just trying every day to do the get through the day and do the things you need to. And then slowly we've kind of transitioned as she got better to more in quotes, normal, which is kind of a weird thing to say. Um, things are back to normal, <clears throat> not exactly, but certainly um, that's over time, step-by-step, step, you can kind of give up some of the concerns of being a caregiver and in my case, I eventually retired. So then I had more time and I was way less overwhelmed, you know, besides her healing and being better to, you know, give up, you get back eight hours a day. So all of a sudden, yeah, there's time for those relationships. So initially that kind of goes in the bin with everything else for a while until you get out of that emergency mode. And it's kind of, re you kind of have to rebuild it. It's, um, they're competing things in a way. And as a caregiver, I mean, you have, you're doing things that would normally annoy your spouse, right? Um, you're keeping a real careful eye on her, looking for this, looking for that. Um, you're doing things for her she can't do for herself. And, you know, while that's nice, it's not a happy predicament to be in. And, and as as uh, she seemed to get better, you, you want to loosen up on all that. You want her to be independent and, not, and, and things be in quotes normal, but in quotes normal is not, I mean, it, it's close. So as you normalize, you kind of rebuild that. At first, it seems like it's just, I mean, can I have a nap now? It's like, I need to go to sleep. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> so overwhelmed with what you're doing that, that yeah, that's really back burner. Plus there's all the damage going on. She's not comprehending what's happening in the world and all that. So um, with time, that's kind of, you know, pretty much back to normal. Other than I have to try to not be too controlling and, and give her as much independence as I can. That That's kind of giving up with a caregiver and, and um, you know, wanting her to do as much for herself as she can. Um, there's always, there's tension between that. So it kind of becomes, it kind of becomes a new normal, right? Yeah, it, it, it becomes a new normal. Um, but eventually it's kind of goes back to highly resembling where you were with a few, you know, additional things that just don't happen, you know? So in her case, she has not good balance. So, 
in the winter, if it's slippery, she doesn't go out alone. She doesn't even go to the trash can alone. Um, she doesn't walk her dog alone. And, you know, summertime, that's something that's fine. But her balance is so bad that, you know, we found out she doesn't blow out on snow or ice and things. So there's things you just avoid because they're, in quotes, dangerous. But so you don't, yeah, things are with accommodations, but psychologically it's kind of much more normal where the relationship has gotten, um, you know, at one time it's like you're taking care of a child and then, you know, those days are pretty much gone. So it, it's become, it, it never really goes away completely though, does it? It's no, there's no. always that bit. Well, you're there's, playing. there's two things that don't go away and I think are predominant. Um, it, or haven't in our case. I know that on occasion she ha she'll have a relapse, so she'll have this stroke-like episode, um, seizure-like episode. It's been described both ways by doctors, but um, we know that can happen, and it can happen at a really not the greatest time. So you become more cautious, and um, you know she can drive a car. She can drive the car. But you make a decision, no, I'm not going to drive the car. Well, why? If I have one of those, then, you know, what if I run up the sidewalk? I, I cause an accident. So you have to, there's some points where you do the whole risk reward and you go, no, I can drive. You don't have to. So we have that covered. So, you know, you cover up certain things and you try to be as normal as possible when the risk is okay. You know, so in the summer, yeah, she's up and down the in the backyard she goes wherever she wants but in the winter no 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 she didn't want to fall out and break the arm or something so yeah we're, we're we've become cautious in in a way in a lot of ways um just recognizing the reality i mean you find the world wrecked and you try to make things as normal as possible so things that she can do and are safe yeah you you want you want to see that and she's adapted back to a reasonably high level, which is good. Not everyone does. And there's times you didn't know that, obviously. So. I'm sure there were times that you wondered whether she would become more back to herself than <laughs> well, the beginning. The, like the first, you know, three or six months, boy, yeah, it was super bleak. And, and that was, seemed less not like a really likely thing, you know, uh, because some of the information they gave us was wrong. You know, it was, HE was considered much more rare than it was. It hadn't been diagnosed. A lot of people had it and they didn't recognize it. And they give you the, well, your brain will really recover a lot. Like in 12 months, you should be really great. And oh, you'll have almost everything back by 18 months. And then after 12 months, when she's still having trouble forming letters or something, you're like, well, wait a minute. According to what they're telling me, you're almost as good as you're going to get. This is terrible. So according to what they told us in the beginning, um, she wasn't on much of a path. But, you know, information's out there that, that brains do heal. And the old information was just plain wrong about brain injuries. So it was a much longer road, but... You know, once you're on the once you're on the road and you're seeing improvement, life gets a lot easier. The moment, just to rewind back to where we started, the, the, to that moment in time when you haven't seen any improvement, you just feel like it's not coming. And and that, the, yeah, that was the bleakest, hardest time where you have to things look bleak because they are, and you have to um, somehow be optimistic enough to keep doing the things you're going to do, you know, and as soon as you start seeing healing, well, that gets a lot easier. So, I mean, for anyone who's in that period where, I mean, things are fully damaged and things seem all wrecked and nothing has begun to go back together for us, things did. And it was a slow process, but once it starts, it's, it's so much easier because it's easier. You don't feel like you're just, living on wishful thinking, she'll be okay, but you don't see any progress. That's a hard time. It's a hard time. So yeah, once, the, once the progress starts, you know, you it might be impatient, but at least you, you know, it's possible at that point. And, you know, telling people that I think may be helpful. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't have a whole lot of voices out there 
saying that. I mean, I met a few people early on that we met some people at Faces that had it. And it really helped me to see someone who's two or three years ahead of her, being hopeful that she may be there in two or three years. So it's it's slow. It's so true, though, if you can talk to other people that have gone through the same experience, you get a more of a sense of hope and um, you see the reality of it. Um, when she was diagnosed and you know that I was diagnosed at the same time, um, there wasn't any information out there. And what was out there was misinformed for us. I mean, it was misinformation because it didn't work that way in, in reality um, as far as healing and getting better. So I, I understand that so well. <laughs> Um, Steve, how long did it take Nick to get diagnosed? Well, she had two trips to the local hospital. And uh, the first one, she was in there, I don't know the exact amount of days, but I, it was around 10 days. And then she was back home for a short period. And then she went back. And... <clears throat> They, so we're on our second visit and they really, they didn't find anything. They, our local hospital didn't have anyone. I think that it maybe even had any experience at all with HE. So they didn't even know to look for it. And they were getting ready to send her home. And my daughter, who she works at a local hospital, she has her whole life. And so she knows a lot about hospital protocols and things. She looked at the report from the neurologist and he really hadn't even done a decent neurological workup on her. And she said, you're not sending her home. What are we gonna do with her? You're not sending her home. Number one, second opinion, because the first opinion is not even done. Get a neurologist in here and out of doubt. And so they did. And then they talked around in a team. The neurologist then started getting some inklings. They got a real neurological workup. And through the process, it was decided to send her to the University Hospital down in Chicago, the U of I hospital. So once she was there a week, they had that figured out and had given her the first steroid dose. And so... Um, I guess all of that process was only around two months for us. So we were lucky that she actually got the steroids that early on. Because at that point, I mean, she was really, she was really, really damaged. She, she really couldn't speak. I'm not sure she had any idea, you know, of any of the reality of what was going on. So, I mean, she guaranteed if you put a piece of toast and a butter and a knife in front of her, she wouldn't know what to do with any of it. I mean, her, her she was really, really, her, her, she was super damaged. So anyway, um, had she carried on like that without the steroids, who knows what the outcome would have been. But for us, it was fairly quick. Um, it didn't seem like it at the time because, you know, <laughs> the condition she was in. But I know others have gone on a lot longer. Um, but I think we were super lucky. If it was just up to me, I wouldn't have dealt with the hospital personnel the way my daughter did. I wouldn't have realized and recognized what my rights were to say, you can't send her home. No, you can't. You can't fix her, send her some, to someone who will. And, and so um, that was very helpful. I think a lot of people get it get like us and there she's sent home and then what, she's going to be having seizures every hour or two. Uh, what are we going to do with this? So I don't know, eight or 10 weeks at the max. And uh, I guess we were fortunate in that. Yeah. If, you know, like you said, there's so many people that it, sometimes it takes years to get the proper diagnosis. So in that scope of things, you were lucky, but it seems as if she was having a fast progressive um, disease uh, I, I can't explain it right what I'm thinking. So as you're probably used to with people with Nick, right. but um, it, you know, hers was 
progressing and um, had to be really scary. It could have gotten so much worse than what it was even if they right. wouldn't have found it. Right. We're pretty sure that she'd have suffered, you know, more damage until they give the steroids and actually stop all that, that from going on. So, and, and you know, that was a night and day difference thing. I mean, it wasn't, that wasn't subtle. There's sometimes people are going, I take this vitamin, I feel energy or something. Uh, so you, you, you take the vitamin, this wonderful vitamin, you're like, nah. but no, that wasn't subtle. She went from, you know, she can't even listen to a sentence and she looks like she's afraid. And there's this look in her eye like, huh? To, oh, the lights back on and wow. she wasn't articulate, but you knew she was there and she was understanding. And then she was trying to talk before she was just like, you know, just staring out. It's, it's like, you know, just pretty much gone. So wow. once they gave her the steroid, I mean, it was perfectly obvious. She went, you know, from zero to 90% again. I mean, she was back, although, you know, all, everything was disordered in her mind. She, she you know, things were scrambled but had she remained without the steroids for another month or two or three who knows how much you know damage would have been done to the brain because some was done anyway obviously <laughs> obviously so I, we're, we're fortunate so I scary think, i think so now scary. people get steroids routinely a lot quicker so did they anyway. actually i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you no. um did they actually uh diagnose her then with hashimoto's encephalopathy at that point they did. They did. And it's, it's interesting to think back because I can remember the doctors saying, oh, it is such a rare disease. There's only, I don't know if they're like, oh, there's only been 200 people diagnosed with uh -huh. some, something like that, which, okay, maybe that is, so, maybe that's true. There was a slow number of diagnoses, but obviously they're finding out that, well, oh, it's not so rare. As a matter of fact, within, um, within just about three or four years, our own family doctor had seen a couple more HE patients at the local hospital and they knew what to do then, or he knew what to do with his patients. So all of a sudden it was be, just becoming recognized. It just was thrown in another basket forever. And so when you get that information, then you do feel weird. Like, how can this be that what 200 people have that and you have it? How can that even be? You think of the odds of that. And then you find out, no, okay, likely. Yeah, you know, I so much higher. So I remember being told the same thing. And um, it was so difficult because you thought, how same thing, how in the heck could I have that when there's only a couple hundred people in the world? diagnosed with it um it makes it quite uh scary when you think you're one of only 200 that's for sure right yeah and yeah and then you think no one's ever going to do anything about this because only a couple hundred people have it then once they start realizing oh wait a lot more people have <laughs> this is not nearly so rare then yeah maybe you get a little attention and progress which we've we've seen some of that a whole lot of that um, Steve, how did it affect or did it affect the family dynamics at that time? And I think you probably did answer some of that already. Um, some of that. How your position changed. Yeah. Um, well, I think that it's easy to see the, the family dynamics kick in during that time and it it's interesting for me when my when nick first went in the hospital my son and i and sarah we all went out and saw her we're all at the hospital and stuff and after one trip to the hospital my son is like i don't i don't know I, I don't want to go see her today i don't want to go with her and he's he's like you didn't want to do that did not want to go to that hospital. So my daughter and I, we just met there every afternoon and she's out of the hospital and, you know, time goes on. And uh, it's interesting because you see this whole phobia thing. He doesn't like hospitals. He doesn't like doctors. As soon as she's home, well, every day he stayed with her when I was at work and then he worked the afternoon shift. 
and he actually rearranged his life to help out. It's not like he didn't want to help, but as it progresses, you just see people's, you see the dynamics and everything just, they manifest themselves. And in our case, mostly in good ways, I have to say. So, um, yeah, I, I think we were, I think we were pretty lucky. I was lucky the, you know, in that my two kids who were living close by were super supportive and they were involved. And a lot of times people just aren't. Um, oh, you're right. Families, a lot of times they just, they look at it and they pull away from it and they, they back away. And the family dynamics can be horrible. Um, actually, my older wife's brother has had a TBI. She had a brain injury and a motorcycle accident. And she's impaired a lot like Nicola's impaired some of the similar symptoms you know from albeit from a different source but her family it's like her brothers and sisters at christmas my brother says it's heartbreaking none of them want to talk to her you know none of them come visit her anymore they act just like and and so yeah there was none of that in our family which is i'm very thankful for that just because I don't know why that in the long run, how do you not have hard feelings over that? So I don't know. Everything wasn't perfect in our family, but um, in their own way, everyone stepped up. It was an impossible task for one person. Actually, for Jesse and I, we kind of teamed up. My son and I, it was impossible for us, really. If you think about it, we both had to work and then keep an eye on her every minute when we weren't working or sleeping. And that went on for, well... After one year, it eased up a lot. So it went on a long time. And um, for everyone who's out there working for a living and they're like, I work 50 hours a week. Boy, I don't have much time for myself. Yeah, okay. Well, boy, I get that. And then all of a sudden you have like, take the not much and it's like no time for yourself. So I don't know, people in our family, it, it, I feel real good about the our dynamics we were we were lucky there weren't so many of us and nobody just turned their back so that was great that's wonderful that's wonderful uh, you're right it doesn't always happen that way and uh you do find out the family members and your friends that step up when something like that happens you know. Right, but you don't always know why they don't. It's like that first week when she's in the hospital and Jesse only wanted to go once. And I know this because she's been ill in the past and he never wants to visit her in the hospital. It's not that he doesn't want to see her and he does it, but he's really uncomfortable with it. Well, so are my sister-in-law's family. They're uncomfortable with it and you don't know why, but if for the whole time, Jesse had like turned his back and I just can't deal with it. I would, that would like blow my mind. But the, you know, the fact that, oh yeah, for that moment in time, he can't deal with the hospital, but in his own way, he was as helpful as he could be. I mean, I feel fortunate when people turn their back and there isn't really a way for them to engage, they're probably wishing they could. Right. But, oh God, I don't know what to say to her or him and things like that happen. And so it, it's really hard on families. A lot of times, caregiver will just be kind of off separated and people will keep their distance and that so I'm fortunate I I had a lot of help especially at key points um things would have turned out a lot worse had I not had help so it's enough of a burden anyway so caregivers can feel so alone sometimes um because it puts so much stress on you and you don't have time for yourself and um which brings to the next question, and again, I think we've touched on it, is, you know, your own emotional being, it had to be such a toll in your own self. I mean, it had to be mind boggling for you. I don't know any other way to put it. Um, yeah, the, your, my, my emotional well-being, yeah, it took a big slam. And um I'm really an optimist in life, but I've always been one that has encouraged others to just look at the world the way you find it and not be struggling all the time to make the world the way you want it. No, I do try to make the world the way I want it. I'm responsible and I understand the cause and effect, but in some cases, 
things you just accept, like, you know, the attitudes of some person you have to work with. You're not likely to change that. So you find it. And that person is typically nice, but they're grouchy every Monday. Well, get used to it and get over it. But um, so my emotional well-being, I, I really try to look at the world the way I found it, find it at all times. And yeah, the way I found it in the world was pretty terrible. Lots of, I mean, oh my God. Uh, you know, so many things are just sort of being wrecked and it keeps, it's hard to keep your perspective and remain optimistic. Um, at that point, honestly, my optimism that I was clinging to felt like just like wishful thinking, right? And once she started healing, then it didn't feel so much like wishful thinking. I felt like you're actually going somewhere. That's sort of the difference between early on, you feel like you're on some elevator, you can push some buttons and it won't go up and down and the door won't open. And you're like, okay, we're not going anywhere. What's happening here? And there's nothing happening, right? And there's really no way to take it anywhere. And at that point, it is really crushing. You're, I mean, I'm looking at my spouse and she's like gone. And, and you know, things that seemed important could fall apart. And you didn't really care, you know, like, um, oh, my car needs an oil change. Okay, let's get worried about that, right? So all, everything just goes. But um, yeah, very, very difficult early on. Um, but as progress became made, um, you know, you feel like you're moving all of a sudden, like the elevator door opens, you don't know what you're coming out to, but at least things are moving ahead. So I don't know, it, it was, um, it's tough. You give up all the things you, you were doing. I mean, I, I was at the time still in school, had been back in school, taking some uh, management classes and stuff. And, you know, so I had to stop that and I had to stop this. And you start going down the list of things that you were doing that you just don't do anymore. And emotionally that's hard, but you, you're looking at a person who's sitting there destroyed and, and you feel guilty if you even feel sorry for yourself a little as bit, you know? I so there is a voice there that kind of pushes you on and kind of says, oh, your problem? And then you look, that's much worse. So I don't know. It was, it, it's devastating. I, I have to say, um, I think everyone gets some post-traumatic stress disorder. Out of oh, yeah. I, think, I think we do. We go months and we don't sleep right exactly. And nothing's quite, yeah, you're, it, it, it's, it's tough. Um, anyway. Um, that's so true. You know, um, How's Nick doing now? How, how is she feeling? It's been, what, 10 years, I believe. Ten years. Um, currently, like right now, today, the last few days, super good. Um, she's had some residual things. And one of the things that plagued her a little bit here the last couple months, she, she had some recurring migraines. So three weeks in a row. She got a migraine on Friday, it lasted all weekend. The next week, she got a migraine on Friday, it lasts all weekend. And uh, two weeks later, she got a migraine on Thursday that lasted all weekend. And it was just horrible. And when she gets them, she's nauseous, so she can't swallow and eat. And, you know, she stays in bed and it has to be darkened. And it's just a miserable couple of days. And so she had a bout with that this, this winter. And um, we figured out a couple of migraine triggers over the years. And truthfully, you know, year by year, they haven't been getting worse, but boy, you get a cluster like that and it's just awful. So I think that was her January. Um, as far as her um, cognitive things go, which is the thing we're most concerned about, for the most part, she's doing quite well. Um, but in fact, her short-term memory loss is still there. It's completely unreliable. So she has all these residuals, um, um, which is really difficult for her. She's learned that she'll do things without remembering them. So if they're important, she writes things down. And she's got all sorts of ways to not do something twice, <laughs> so to speak, um, and forget you did it. But um, as far as, yeah, the cognitive stuff, when she's, doing well 
it's she's fairly much back to a normal person, which is a great success. Um, her setbacks haven't been quite as devastating the last few years. She hasn't had one where she gets um, one of her seizure-like episodes and then she's days and days recovering from it. Typically now she gets those things and now, you know, in half an hour, she can kind of resume and do what she was doing and it's not nearly as disruptive. So somehow she still gets them, but it's been years since it just knocked her where she was just down for days. They're, they're, somehow they're not as severe as they were. They, when they're happening, they look the same. She'll get where she's like pointing and, and she can't speak and, and she's get, getting that or, or she's getting the symptoms you know, she'll get the muscle jerking or the muscle lock up, but there, there's a few things. So she still gets it, but at least when it happens, I don't have to think, oh God, is she going to be like this for a month? Is this going to be three or four days? So she hasn't had a true, true setback in a long time. And so we're really, I mean, we're, we're happy for that. That's wonderful. But to think that you know, like you said before, in the beginning, they said, oh, a year or so she'll be back to normal. And it's been 10 years. Right. And, you know, you're happy with how things are going. And I mean, it's just such wrong information that was given to us in the beginning. Um, we've learned. <laughs> Yeah, that was hard. That was hard because you're approaching the one year and you're like, okay, this is nothing. That means we're getting nothing because you want to believe the doctors, but, but definitely. Um, yeah, she's still progressing, which is interesting. I mean, our lives are progressing. I, my memory is getting worse. Okay. And I don't compare my memory loss to hers, but absent H E in her life, she's getting to the age where things would be, not improving anyway. I don't think you're, if you're, if you're the marathoner when you're 60, you're probably not setting the same time as you were two decades ago, right? So things are, everything's kind of going downhill a little bit, but uh, in her case, it's great that, you know, she still seems, her health is getting slowly better. So, um, some of her conditions have gotten more manageable or some, you know, some of the things have kind of disappeared altogether. So it is, it's, it's, it's slow progress, but it still feels good as you see improvements. So. It's, it's still progress, however you look at it, you know. Um, yeah, she's getting slowly more independent. There's more things she can do, which is, you know, that's, I think, one of the most frustrating things for anybody is losing your independence. And you can't do the things you, you want to do and you used to do. So, Oh, absolutely. So and she was a very good. independent person before oh, yeah. that. Yeah. So was Nick ever, you know, there's so many people that are misdiagnosed with a um, psychological issue instead of HE. Had she ever gone through that like others have? Yeah, at least two doctors said that. And um, one early on, and I don't really remember the circumstances, much of that, but the one that was um, really a bad experience and frustrating was she got, um, we got her up to Mayo Clinic and the doctor that saw her up there, um, he, he was a older guy. He had his picture on his little book in the waiting room. And he had this book. He's a big expert for um, Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's is kind of related in a way. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to go up there, we had heard there were several people working on HE. So we were given this doctor. He walked in the room and I do believe, I just think that he already has mine made up. I don't think he, his mind was made up that it was, functional all in her head when he walked in absolutely uh, he he just came across with that and so that was devastating to her because we get to this 
big institution with this great reputation. And they give you some dinosaur who comes in with his mind made up. And so that was devastating. Provide a great bunch of time for tears driving home and anger and upset and so frustrating. And our family doctor was really good and supportive. You know, we went back and talked to him. He's like, okay, well, we want to get you some help. Where are we going to go now? Come on, let's put this behind us. But that was devastating because so much hope was there. You're going to this great place. Yay, we get to go there. And like one minute with this guy, it was one minute. And, and it was like, huh. And pretty much get over it, you know, go see a shrimp. What? Are you kidding? So, yeah, th- and that was horrible because she already had a diagnosis from a reliable uh, institution and um, with great evidence that she was steroid responsive. So, you know, that's one of the biggest markers anyway. So it's too bad that that we sort of somehow drew him out of the deck as a doctor up there but that was that that was devastating and the first time wasn't it wasn't happy either but i don't remember the circumstances much the one at mayo was just it's just heartbreaking you know you take a week off vacation and you're looking forward to this oh my god we're gonna go there maybe these guys can know something this is gonna help and it's like a slap in the face and you go home now so it was terrible it happens it happens to so many people and people that have already got a diagnosis like nick did and um just looking for maybe more treatment options and then they're told they have something else wrong with them and you know psychological and that's In maybe some cases it is, I'm not saying that, you know, but when you know, like you said, Nick was steroid responsive and how can you, you know? Yeah, that's, I mean, it was really, really obvious and they already had that argument. I mean, that here's this guy and there's no one to talk to him and he just makes a decision. But that discussion went on down at the university hospital during their diagnosis, because it was the younger doctors that had heard of HE and were bringing it up, and the guy managing the case wasn't buying it. And it took him a few days before they convinced him to get that they should give her steroids. And he's like, okay, well, I guess we can try. Steroids are really bad, but I guess so. He, he reluctantly gave in, and then boom, you know, within a day, even he's on board like, oh, wow, whoa, look at that. So it, 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 something. <laughs> anyway, it's funny because we already had experts go through that and they t- t- kind of decided in a kind of, kind of a funny way. It's kind of like your car's on the side of the road. What's wrong? I don't know. Gas shows we got gas. What are we going to try? I don't know. You know, and you go, you want to try something, right? At, the, at a certain point, you know, you, you, as a doctor, yeah, you have to evaluate the risk, but they had already done that and shown it was steroid responsive. So had he looked at the case, he'd have come in more open-minded. I, I think he, I think he glanced at the papers at the very basic write up and thought this is someone just shopping around for a diagnosis or some crap and just came in with an attitude, you know, that's just and, heartbreaking to me, you know, it just, yeah, is. that was hard because eh, whatever, you know, um, Yeah, I don't, I don't look at Mayo Clinic quite the same. I'm not angry with them. I, I, I understand how, I understand how um, it is when you're running an organization like that. Everybody could have similar credentials. Like, yes, I'm credentialed to do this, but not everyone has the same empathy. Not everyone has the same true talents and backgrounds. And we, just, we got stuck with the wrong person. And yeah, that reflects poorly on Mayo in a way. I mean, but, you know, they have a lot of employees. They're not all going to be, you know, you hope they're better than average, but boy, we didn't get it there. (laughs) That was was a long drive home. I am telling you, that was a very long drive home. Lots of crying, lots of Nick has got a great doctor that's been treating her for many years now, though, right? He does, right. And what treatments have, I, you know, Nick hasn't had a whole lot of uh, medication or anything, correct? 
no, she is not. And um, in the beginning, we're, you're looking at all of these. And she was relentless and looked and looked and looked and trying to find all of these treatments. And one of the, some of the treatments that are easier to get today, I know, weren't so easy back then. And they tried to get her, the one doctor applied to my insurance for, I think the plasma phoresis or something. And it was expensive, like 20 some thousand a month or something. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. It was, it was costly. You get a treatment, it's like 20 grand or whatever it was. It was expensive. And they, they kind of pushed back. And then the doctor kind of gave up and didn't push on i don't know if he pushed on if they would have eventually relented but somehow or another it, it became not worth decided it was not worth the effort on their part that they, they they gave up with insurance and so i you know i don't know all the reasons behind that but um i think in the long run it's okay because by the time we were there we'd already seen we knew that plasmapheresis is like, I mean, this is like a temporary thing. It's got to be done constantly. Okay. And so, you know, it, it's essentially like if you take a monthly vitamin, you have to go back because it depletes itself. So the, it, it, it's something that, that's ongoing and um, it has shown pretty good efficacy, but still back then we kept hearing about people that, oh, he or she is on methotrexate. Oh, and they're so much better. Well, we experienced her being on nothing and getting so much better. And then you hear two, three months later, oh, he's in the hospital and it's really bad or, or she died, right? So we realize, well, she's been, it's like it remits for a while and then it comes back and we see this. And it's very easy to say, whoa, a week after we started this pill, which may have nothing to do with it, she got so much better when maybe we experienced her getting better and then getting worse. And it's the sad part is it's like you're going slowly up an escalator, but when it goes down, it's like, you're like, yeah, you're, you're 10 stories down in the elevator, then you're the slow climb back up. But we came to the conclusion that we just didn't have enough information to even make a, a reasonable decision on it. They're saying, well, this helps a little and someone's really helped by it. And next thing you hear, their their life is horrible again. And, and so at one point we decided just stop grasping for things. Keep your eyes open. Obviously she's plugged into that world. And if there's a breakthrough that's real, we'll know about it. But we just decided to let her body work on it by itself. And um, it, that's, it's, it's just worked out. I mean, slowly her body has been healing. And part of the issues are some of her symptoms were, were bad enough that even absent that condition, a normal person like me, they would degrade my condition. So her, she, she had the, involuntary muscle spasms that were horrible, the myoclonus. And literally, it, it had to be 90 plus percent of the time when she laid down, she would start that jerking. And this wasn't like one or two things. It's not like a sneeze. Oh, and this time I sneezed four times. It is like a sneeze. You can't stop it. It's involuntary. But there's times I went to sleep I laid there and watched her jerk for half an hour. And each one of these jerks can be like a, a whole setup. It's an involuntary thing where her body jerks up, her legs jerk up, her body jerks up, then it goes back. And it'll go on and on and on and on and on and on. And there's times I woke up and it was like an hour and a half later and she's jerking still. So how does your body heal? And that's just one of the more dramatic ones. But I think many people with this have symptoms that in and of themselves it, without good sleep, how are you going to heal? And so getting past that was a big thing. Once, once she managed that and we got that to, to go away and she started sleeping, all of a sudden that escalator ride up really went more in earnest. Her, she got so much more physical health and she got so much better. Go figure, you know? So, um, and I'm sure that's probably the way with, 
with uh, the whole thing is some of the symptoms just really do drag you down, even if there's nothing else wrong with you. So, um, and for your brain to heal, get rid of that inflation, inflammation, you need, oh, you need to eat. Eat. Oh, you need it so bad. Yeah, so, yeah. so, yeah, you know, it's, it, it takes a while because a, a lot of these smaller things that have risen up out of it um, are all contributing to weighing down the system. And um, I don't know, I, how do you not be depressed? I was very surprised, you know, in the whole thing that um, her anxiety and depression didn't become completely unmanageable. And I know for a while it did, but, you know, besides the physical thing, there you are every night, have fun, want to do sit-ups for 45 minutes? I don't, you know, two or three is good enough for me. I know I can sit up, I'm good. But, um, you know, what, what about the emotional impact? The, uh, beyond the physical, just the emotional impact of that is, I don't know. It's it's impressive that she was able to get through it as well as she did, um, because, I mean, how does that not break your spirit? So yeah, there's a lot of things step by step by step. There's so many obstacles. It's like things are strewn everywhere. You know, there's things that trip on every way you turn. And, but um, anyway, um, well, she's such a strong person, and sometimes I hate that when people say that you're so strong because you know. Ugh. But she is, she's a strong person and it probably her determination took her right. through this journey. You know, right. I think you have to be determined. Um, oh, you have to be in a, and, and not giving up is, well, maybe you just can't give up. I don't know, but an awful lot of people kind of do, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's, been a long journey but the worst part was in the beginning so i mean to, to do kind of a just a little bit of a wrap up you your whole world is falling apart things are so bleak they look bleak they really are bleak um <laughs> you're uh there's you're experiencing all this damage your hopes your dreams the things everything you're working on some of them seem like they don't even mean anything anymore and they're they're falling apart and in a way you you don't even care and so the beginning is so bad that once like that elevator door opens and you can just get out of there and your life can go anywhere they can it can go anywhere you know even the trip to mayo that was an unhappy step but it was a, it was a step along the destination. So, um, in a strange way, if you had planned, I mean, I got to retirement age. Had I planned to get to retirement age and everything was wonderful and everything I planned in the world happened. Oh, and I had five times the money I was hoping for, and I'm so healthy and everything's great. And then life slowly starts going downhill. Even having achieved everything and everything is great, things start to hit you and you're going downhill, it never feels good. And so I think the most encouraging thing I can say is, as rough as it is to like have your house blown down, have a tornado come through, the experience after you bottom out, um, at least it's a positive one, at least our lives, they haven't gone to where we wanted them. They haven't gone to where we planned them to be. However, um, it slowly, incrementally got better. And that's actually, you know, that's awesome compared to be being sitting where life is hopeless. So I know people are who whose family members have any kind of situation like this. It can even be like my brother's wife. It's a head injury. She has many of the same symptoms. People go through this and life is super bleak. However, um, in our case, and I, I, I know quite a few people, um, hey, work for your victories and uh, keep trying because um, as low as you are, things will get better. And as things get better, it's just a good feeling. It does, you know, it doesn't matter that we thought 
she would work till X number of years. We thought we would take a trip to Europe and go to, you know, Denmark, where my relatives came from, and maybe to Rome or some great place. Yeah, we had plans, and those plans aren't coming. But um, from where we were, our life looks awesome. So um, it's little by little, but I'll take a little improvement every month and year, and um, it, eventually it adds up. I I, I feel like where we are now is much better than was anticipated and for the first several years. So things have, eh, we're there, we're, we're, we're much better um, and just praying not to have a big setback, so. Well, I pray that they remain better and that um, there's still improvement. And I, um, I know that I really appreciate, Steve, you taking time to sit and talking to me and to us and being so honest and open. Um, it's so important for other caregivers to see that somebody else has felt the same way, gone through the same thing, um, experienced the same things. Um, they don't feel quite as alone when they hear somebody else talk. So I really appreciate you being with me today. And like I said, I pray that you guys keep doing good. Well, thanks for that. And, and I'm glad to do it. I have to admit, um, initially, you don't want to think about that. I know. <laughs> it's like, to think yeah, back. <laughs> like my, my brain goes there sometimes. And it goes there when it's ready to go there. But... Mm, actually trying to think a little bit about you know the way things were and bring things back in perspective was a good thing but my, my brain didn't want to do it I'm really glad though it, it, it I'm glad because you need to take stock from time to time it helps you keep a clear-eyed view so and um, I do I do appreciate the help that I got from a couple of people early on because you know, that first six months or something, you really are pretty lost. And just seeing someone who's just a couple years ahead, you realize, oh, and they say, no, she was just like that. You know, she would just be, we'd go to walk to the car and she'd lay on the sidewalk and everyone would be concerned. And I'd say, stop it, people. No, no 911. Give her a minute, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And all the sort of things that were happening, you heard, no, it used to happen all the time. And well, yeah, she's not perfect, but I could just see, okay, this is going to be easier. So I feel um, good about at least giving people a little bit of hope. And, and um, it's, it's tough because uh, already your brain tells you the danger you're in. People die from this. This, yeah. is not a, this is not a good thing, but it's not necessarily the end either. So, No, so. And, I, and you've done a great job explaining all that to people today. And you've probably helped many people that are starting that journey and explain to them that things can get better and they will get better. Um, you know, where they might have felt hopeless, you're doing for them what your friends in the beginning did for you. You're paying yeah. back. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So some of the, that first trip down to face has really helped me. I, I, knew, I could see more clearly what I was in for. And then they dispelled some of the medical th things that were commonly held by doctors at the time that listen, nothing against these guys. They don't know. This is how it really is. Your brain actually heals for years and years and years. You know, and some guys came and talked and, you know, there's a guy who's actually run over by a car and had a serious, serious brain injury. He was, he had, oh my God, almost every, bro he was in his yard and he was hit by a car going like 50 miles an hour and, and nearly every bone broken in his body and just so severely his brain damaged. And he, it, he, it had been like 15 years earlier and he described all of this and he couldn't walk, he couldn't do anything, but, you know, all that, the, all that damage, and yet the body still, all those years later, he's gotten to the point where, hey, he can public speak and things. Are, are Amazing. You so, 
anyway, when you meet a couple people that actually say, wait, they told me this. And it's, it's true. It's absolutely just isn't true, you know, and, and don't worry, science will catch up. It's catching up. And then you feel a tiny bit better. You're like, okay, um, hmm. Well, it is all hope is not lost because you really feel like it. I mean, you how, would you, that. how would you not? Especially they tell you, I mean, the call at home at work was, oh, your wife had a stroke and she couldn't speak. And the rescue squad took her to the hospital. So you go there, yeah, your wife had a stroke. You go in the room, you know, like her mouth's hanging out. Hello, uh, nothing there. Well, yeah, uh, that's an optimistic place to be, you know, and it didn't get much better for that. If, you know, until she got that steroid shot, it's the lights were never on again, you know? And so, yeah, 10 weeks or whatever of that, that's. That's a yeah. long time though. You go, to, you go to a place where, you know, you're relatively sure um, this is not insignificant. You know, this is going to, this is a life-changing event. I, and, and my God. Um, Scary. And, then in the midst of it, everyone's lives unravel in all sorts of weird ways. And, you know, people become unable to work, both the victim of the illness and sometimes the caregiver just has to stop working. My brother retired early after the motorcycle accident so he could take care of his wife. He, they put her, the hospital put her in a nursing home because they said, well, she's not quite good, well enough to um, come home and she was there a week and he went to work and said, I'm, I'm retiring. I'm not coming back. She's fallen down like five times since she's been in there. They're not taking care of her. I am done. I'm done. That's it. And he just retired. Well, God, that's a life change. And I don't know. He was like 60. I was he. So he was like five years early. And, and many people, as you know, there are people whose families just abandon them and, and, they have absolutely no financial anything. So, I mean, I, I'm grateful. I was able to hang on to my job and we're economically relatively secure. Have we suffered damage? Well, sure, she was an attorney, whatever, right? But um, to me, that's insignificant because I actually, we actually have our needs covered. And, and so, yeah, how, how do you complain about that? So many people are in a spot where you know, you'll, you'll have your, your little disability from social security and good luck with that. That pays a third of what you need. Have a fine life. Not only are you, are you compromised in almost every way uh, you're given an um, impossible thing to juggle. I feel so sorry for the people I've met who are alone on this and don't have a caregiver, you know, I mean, my heart goes out to them because I, we've all met a few of them along the way too. Yeah, and you're like, bad. I travel. How did that woman get from wherever over here? You took a bus? Really? I think I'll put Nick on a bus. You flew by yourself? I'm like, oh, okay. And they're doing everything by themselves. And you know what? Yeah, they're the ones that fall on the ice too, right? Yeah. They're the ones that got the bad arm because whatever their disability caused an, another pitfall. So yeah, the, I mean, it's we have enough pitfalls on our own with two sets of eyes. I, I just can't imagine how tough it can be. For I, always, I always a, feel that um, no matter what life has given me, my cup is still half full and not half empty because you see so many people so much worse off um, that I have to say I'm grateful, you know, for what I have been able to do or what things have um, happened and um, I just have to look at that cup half full and I know that you guys are like that and Nick's like that and you know and I think that's what gets you through yeah yeah you we certainly have gratitude for um, the fact that somehow some of the basics of life weren't as destroyed for us like they were for others. I just can't imagine that here you are with all these problems and then you're thrown into the last few years of your life. You, you can't really even just go to the store and buy the food you want. I mean, you, you, you'd like to go to a conference, but are you kidding? That, I'd need a motel for three nights and travel costs and 
you know, something that's five hundred thousand dollars. They're like, ha ha, that's millions of dollars. I'm not. I'm never going to be able to have that. So we're not in that position. We have, luckily, we have enough to live a, you know, a, a reasonable lifestyle. We've never had an extravagant one anyway. So we haven't had a big throw down five steps down the ladder we you know we're still in our house and and we're i think we're financially better off than the average person of our age and that's almost remarkable considering I the, guess. you know the likelihoods because oh i i, I stopped working i i would have i stopped at 62 i'd have worked to 67 i loved my job i was really good at it it was really really great i i was one of the lucky people where I was happy at work. Unbelievable. I loved what I did. And I would, and so, yeah, that was taken away and I'd have made more money. I mean, I'd be retiring this year probably. Yeah. So and I've been, I've been retired five years. Actually, that's a blessing. And uh, yeah, we'd have had more if we all worked, but God, once you have enough for the basics and you're like, oh, that eye drop, I take some, my meds are, I take eye drops because I have glaucoma, but Recently, I got a new prescription and the stupid thing, the, the copay was 150 bucks. And for oh. some people, that'd be, oh, oh, that ruined my month. And it's like, oh, I'm glad I have money. That makes me mad. <laughs> you know, 30 days of drops. And it's, why are you kidding? But that, my other drop, I get two, it was $60. And I was really thought that was bad until. But, uh, you know, you just think about. Yeah, oh, my gosh. For a moment, you're angry, but you don't stand there and think. I can't buy that. Maybe one, maybe just the one will be fine. Maybe I won't go blind, right? Not take your meds, you know? So, I mean, we're able to, to handle some costs. And, and, and just, and then you think of those poor people that can't. They can't. They're, they're trying to live on $1,100 a month or something, you know, whatever they that can't do it. is. And especially if your family isn't there for whatever reason, you don't have help. You're just, you're, you're in a, literally, I mean, you're in a hopeless place. Like, Okay, actually, you know, the funny thing is that um, for most people, it wouldn't be the worst thing. Oh, I don't really don't have enough. And you realize it and you say, well, what do we do? Oh, there's a food bank and like, we can go the third Tuesday and they'll give you a, a box of food. Well, I have fun figuring that out when, you know, you can't figure out your cell phone and stuff. So here are these people that are damaged and there is some help out there. But it's not like anyone holds your hand. So I don't know. It's just more and more suffering. So, I mean, I'm so thankful it didn't like break my family apart. Number one, it didn't, um, didn't actually ruin us financially. It was not helpful. Anyone who would think that obviously that's crazy, but um, at any rate, um, <laughs> so the things that wrecked in the long run, um, I guess eventually would be wrecked anyway. I mean, I wouldn't be going to school forever. I was still, I mean, I'd finished up the one uh, degree and I was still working on stuff that had been advised for me for, by my employer and, you know, being the good employee and stuff. And stuff goes, that goes away. Yeah, it's kind of meaningful when you're doing it. But in the scope of things, at this point in my life, I'd have stopped that anyway, eventually. Now I'd have accrued some good takeaways from it, but those little things that are like frosting on the cake. I can't even care about those anymore. You know, they seem significant when they're happening, but I know you experienced your sort of your life being taken away and you had to rebuild and find a different life. You can't go back to the same. That's more of a loss than, than the rest of anything. And then for the poor people who end up alone and fighting it completely. I mean, you know, at least you've got, some reasonable family input and that little bit of help sure goes a long way right oh my gosh yeah I'm so fortunate too I've got my kids are just amazing and uh without them I don't know where I would be so I sure get it yeah right and it's one thing as a caregiver you can carry on with um I don't know I don't know how someone like breaks up with their spouse when this happens but I do know that you'll get irrational. You don't have sleep and nothing is going to be going right in your life. You just have to kind of accept loss of control over a lot of things and give up on them. Um, but boy, think of the poor desperation for those people. Um, I mean, with me, you, when you love someone, you don't really even think of that. You just say, look, and it's like, what am I going to 
do with you now? What can I do for you now? You, you think a different way, but I, I, I don't know. I, I do feel for the people who are all on their own. Um, as a caregiver, boy, you feel the stress and damn, it's hard, but boy, compared to that, to that person having to take all that and the outcome, I don't know. A few of these people have, have managed some reasonable outcomes, even though being on their own, I've been so impressed, but boy, but there's a lot of people who didn't also. The failure rate's got to be terrible when, I mean, initially you don't really even know how to feed yourself. How are you going to do that? You know, and uh, you get a little bit better. You still can't do all the things you need to do. So, I mean, I think we all know how it was when you were young and you bounce a check because you didn't have enough money. And there was another $35. Oh my God, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, so you spiral out of control. The thing you didn't, the little thing you forgot cost you more and it cost you more. <laughs> And you can't afford it anymore. I just can't. I mean, God, being alone with that would be, well, that, that's, I, I don't know how anyone, I, th that would be hopeless. That would be the and I do know, British moment. So I do know quite a few um, people that have lost their spouses because they became ill and the spouses right. couldn't handle it. Yeah. And that's so sad because, you know, better or for worse right <laughs> well right right and i don't know my brain doesn't work that way i never thought this would be the great time to just walk away from this no. but I mean, in different circumstances maybe someone would i mean i don't stand judgment on people but um you know you're you're in a situation where i was in a situation where i could i mean Retirement age, I my last kid was in college. He he was on the Danny ended up on the six-year plan. So what he had it three semesters to go, I think, when she got sick. And we were looking past spending all that money, paying all that tuition, having all those costs, and thinking about preparing to for you know being old people in our retirement and we had a few ideas about this and that, you know, and so, yeah, it all dashes, but I don't know, for me, it wasn't like, I'm going to go on and do more heck with you. Uh, I don't know. My brain didn't work that way, but I don't know. Maybe if you're younger or something, I, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say if I was 30 and I was the executive vice president of some company, I might look at you and I don't have time for that. Right. So, but already we had, shared goals our whole life, you're in love with someone and you're hoping, you've gone through all that crap to raise up three kids. I'm just telling you right now. And our kids were good kids, I'm not complaining, but you've gone through a lot of work. I mean, come on, you've been through 30 years of work and sacrifice. You're right to the end of it, you got a year to go. And then it starts falling apart. Well, you don't give up internally on the hopes you had together. At least not right away. You might realize, oh, some of the stuff isn't going to happen. That was some happy idea, but, um, but still, I don't know. I never lost that feeling of togetherness. And she kept saying for a long time, for months, I, I'm not, I'm not even in here. Oh. I've lost. I can't find so much. So I'm not even in here. You know, oh my gosh! But, you know, so that was so sad, and you're you're feel you're feeling like okay, at this moment she doesn't even think she's the person I married, but you know the, somehow the hopes, your ideas for the future, and just your I don't know it didn't it didn't dash my worldview, you know. I guess that's it, and well, so maybe on. maybe it does with some people, and then that's why they walk away. I I, I don't know. I mean. I knew she wasn't going to be, she was like, oh, I don't care. I'll work till I'm 80. I, I didn't think she'd be, all of a sudden I knew you're not going to be the 72 year old lawyer and I'm going to be kicking back drinking pina coladas here on the back deck here. <laughs> no, we're not going there, but still your hopes and dreams for each other to be together in old age and do all that, no, that doesn't just evaporate. So I don't know, maybe we were just too damn far along in life for me to even think like that. I, I, I don't. I, that was never an issue for me at all. Yeah, it's, uh, I couldn't ever do it either. But I mean, I just know that it's happened and probably people that just aren't strong enough to um, 
deal with the whole thing too. I mean, yeah, you have to be a very strong depends, person. It depends where your relationship is too, I guess. Right. It's, it's, it's really hard to know why, but yeah. I mean, I understand giving up a bit of hope when everything's falling apart, but it didn't seem like any kind of solution to just break it more, you know? I mean, that's not a positive step by any way, although it lets you walk, get away from it. So I don't know. I, 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 can't, I can't really judge how that happens in other people. They're in a spot they're probably half crazy, right? You're under so much stress. So yeah, it I, mean, is. I wouldn't be critical of it. I just don't understand it. It just didn't, it never occurred to me that the good way would you just walk away from this? Maybe that would have been, a, it'd probably been easier, right? I mean, whatever, but I don't know how Yeah, but could it that. be? I mean, wouldn't you yeah. have still felt responsible that like you had to help? I mean, oh my I God, I'd, I'd have probably felt awful forever, I would suspect. Yeah. I don't know, maybe not. People tell themselves all sorts of stories. That's she wasn't true. even She wasn't even sick. The doctor says, said she's crazy and she wouldn't <laughs> stop. You could th- you could tell yourself any kind of story, right? I mean, you That's can. True. And so, if the poor me gets bad enough, I guess me wants relief. I I don't. Know. I didn't see that as an option for relief. That just I thought that would make me even more miserable, you know? Because <laughs> I'm hoping you're getting better. I'm hoping you're getting better, not. Uh, you know? I couldn't you know? live with the guilt. <laughs> oh God. No, no. I yeah, that would be that'd be horrible. So. Okay, Steve, I'm going to thank you again. And again, I really appreciate you sitting and talking to us. And I know we're going to talk to Nick in a couple hours. And um, you guys have been a great people for me. I'm grateful myself to get to know you both. And um, that's a story in itself, right? Uh, From the beginning of Nick and I's, our journey with H.E., and um oh that's that's impressive what you guys achieved is hey you know what that's that's some sort of achievement of a lifetime sort of thing you guys really pulled it together you did something important you actually advanced the you advanced the situation for a lot of people so hooray And, and um now there's it's gaining momentum. There's more people involved. You brought the attention when it was there, sort of gave a little vehicle. And I mean, that's, that, that's super great. Um, we, uh, yeah. I mean, without you guys, I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't have, nothing would have happened. So let's just put it that way. I, I, I'm happy this turned out real well. So. It did. It, I'm so happy. Well, enjoy watching it. Bye-bye. <laughs>